Hey guys, welcome back to Cougar Chem Tutoring. I'm Austin and I'll be running through part one of problem set eight, orbitals and electron configurations. All right, number one, A. State which quantum number is associated with the notions of shell, subshell, and specific orbital of an electron. Okay, so we have four, the four quantum numbers, which we have N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. And we only needed these first three to identify an orbital, right? And then the last one for an electron. Okay, now remember though that the reason that we have these numbers, these numbers come from what? The wave function. And the wave function defines energy levels outside the atom, right? Energy levels outside the atom. And we kind of, um, with our uh, understanding of this, we tried to kind of designate this in the Bohr model, right? Where we had n equals one, and then we had another one that's n equals two. It doesn't actually look like rings around it. Um, we actually know better, right? Knowing that they're, we're using orbitals now instead of um, orbits. Um, and so uh, you can kind of think of these though as kind of these, these areas outside as you progressively get further and further away from the nucleus, the higher the higher, the higher in energy the shells will get. Okay, And within these shells, there are subshells and then the, cons the, the corresponding orbitals as well. Okay, So for the shell, you have to just know that that's going to be n. Okay, So that's going to be your shell. We also call this the principal quantum number. Principal quantum number. And we're just going to put q number. Okay. All right, and then for subshell, subshell, remember when we had a subshell comes from uh, the blocks on the periodic table. So we have the S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. And the way that we get these is what? From the L's, right? So zero was for S, one for P, two for D, and three for F. And we'll learn later why these numbers correspond to those. Um, and it has to do with a, a concept called nodes, okay? But, um, so that makes L our our subshell designation okay subshell we call this um this quantum number technically the angular momentum quantum number you also hear it called the azimuthal it's a little less common to hear azimuthal but um just you'll just have to know that it's it, it's designating the subshell okay and then lastly for a specific orbital it's going to be our m sub l right we needed all three of these quantum numbers in order to identify an orbital and then all four of the other all and then all four quantum numbers to identify an electron right so but for a specific orbital it would just be m sub l and m sub l is called the magnetic quantum number magnetic quantum number okay um and i guess i should say specific orbital specific orbital um you'll learn later here that um we're talking about when we're talking about specific orbital we're talking about technically the orientation of those orbitals so orientation because each orbital in a subshell is going to have a different orientation and so the m sub l will identify which orientation that that is and by default also which specific orbital that will be okay all right letter b what values of l correspond to letters s p d and f why do we use letters to denote the values of angular momentum quantum number l okay so we kind of went over it up here all right i wrote it up there we got L is equal to zero. That's going to be our S orbital. L is equal to one. That's our P orbital. L is equal to two. That's our D orbital. And then L is equal to three. That's our F orbital. Okay. Um, after this, um, you don't technically have to know the orbitals after this. It goes G, H, I, and it just follows the alphabet after that. Okay. But you only have to know really these four. Um, and the reason that we use letters here to, to designate which orbital it is is because it makes it easier when we're writing it out. So let's say we had a two, let's say a two p x orbital, right? Um, or even just a regular just a two p orbital. Okay. Um, in order to have identified it with just numbers, right? I would have had to say two and then one, right? But that doesn't really make sense. It just looks like a regular number, twenty one, right? Because uh, we're using the l uh, quantum number l. So it doesn't really help us to to just to use just the numbers. So we just use um, letters to designate which orbitals we're talking about. Okay, and the reason that we use these, um, that, that, that these uh, correspond to each orbital, remember an S orbital looks like a sphere, okay, a P orbital looks like a, dub, uh, a dumbbell, okay, it's got two lobes, okay, and one, one lobe is out, we usually color one lobe out of phase, and then a D orbital kind of looks like a clover, and then you won't have to know how to draw an F orbital, um, it technically has three lobes, uh, or three uh, nodes, so it go like, goes like this. Um, something to this effect. Um, kind of, it's kind of hard to draw in three D here, but something, uh, something like this. Okay, where you got this, this, and that. Okay, but you won't, you won't need to know. You don't need to know how to learn uh, how to draw that. Just these, the, just these three. Okay, so 
The reason is, is because notice at zero, we have zero planar nodes. And, and we'll go over nodes here in a second. But um, we've got that. That's one planar node. Here's a planar node. Here's a planar node. So this has one. This has two. And that's that corresponds to these, these numbers here. Okay. So letter C says, what type of orbital is designated by n equals 5, L is equal to 2, M sub L is equal to 1, and M sub S is a uh, positive 1 half? Now, we're talking about orbitals here, right? So we don't even need these, this last one here. That's that's to identify an electron, right? So um, if we go to n equals five, okay, so it must be in the five in the fifth period, okay? That's what the that's what the n shells are. We're we're talking about periods in the periodic table, so it must be in the n five. So it's going to be a five something orbital, okay? And l is equal to two is a d orbital, right? So I'm going to say five d. And honestly, you don't even need to know which which d orbital specifically that is. You just need to say, okay, that's five d, okay? All right, so number two, it says for the n equals six shell, how many subshells are there? Okay, so remember my limitations for L, so L, remember L, L is my subshell. The limitations for L are uh, zero to, uh, to n, n minus one, okay? In whole number integers, whole number integers, okay? So if n is equal to six, then L can be, um, I'm just gonna put a line here, L is equal to zero, one, two, three, four, and five, right? But it can't be six because we we can only go up to n minus one. So how many is that? That's one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, so whenever you have an n equals uh, six shell, I'm always going to have six subshells, and it actually works for every other n shell. For every n shell that you have, you're always going to have that many subshells within the n shell. So if you're at n equals 72, okay, there are 72 subshells, okay? It's always just going to work out that way. Oops, shells. Okay. So how many orbitals are in each subshell? Okay, well, it depends. Okay, if we, if we go to L is equal to zero, okay, what the orbitals are designated by which quantum number? By M sub L, right? And M sub L, if you remember, is limited to L negative L to positive L. Okay. Negative L to positive L in whole number integers. Okay. So what does that mean? When L is equal to zero, that just means M sub L can only be zero. So there's only one orbital there. There's only one orbital. So I'm just going to put one orbital. Okay. If L is equal to one, M sub L is equal to negative one, zero, and positive one, right? Those are the possible values for M sub L, which means there must be three orbitals. Okay. Subsequently, I can keep going. M sub two, uh, 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 L is two, and M sub L can equal negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. That's five, right? And you, can you notice the pattern here? We're going up in odds by two. So we're going from one to three to five, and you'll see that the next one is seven. M sub L is equal to negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, and three, right? And that's seven orbitals. So if we go all the way up to N, L is equal to five, so um, you, you kind of understand what's going on here, right? I'm just going to say negative four to four. That's nine orbitals. And then L is equal to five. We got M sub L is equal to negative five to five. And that's 11 orbitals. Okay. So those are the patterns that, that that'll happen for any shell that you work with. It's always going to start at one and increase each subshell by two in, in, in these odd numbers. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. So now they're asking how many total orbitals are there. So you could add all of these up, but let me show you a trick. You could add all those up, but you would get the same answer as N squared. Okay. N squared in this case, since N is equal to six, that means N squared is 36 orbitals. Now, if you were to add 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11, all these, you would get 36, okay? And it just happens to be n squared, and that'll happen every time, every time, okay? So just save yourself some time. If they're asking you how many, it has to be how many orbitals are there in a shell, just take n squared, okay? All right, number three. Which subshell corresponds to each of the following set of quantum numbers? Okay, so I've got n equals 3, so it's in the third period. It's going to be a 3-something. So 3, I don't know what, 3s, 3d, or something. Who, who knows? Okay, so now it's l is equal to 1. Okay, now I know that when l is equal to 1, that's going to be a p orbital. Okay, so that's going to be a 3p orbital. That's my answer. Okay, not too bad, right? So this is going to be a 6-something. And then if l is equal to 2, that must be a 6d orbital. All right. So anytime that they give you um, an N, that's just going to be the period that you start with. And then L, when they give you a value for L, you have to find the corresponding letter or orbital that corresponds to that number. Okay. 
All right, number four, draw diagrams to show the relative sizes, shapes, and orientations of the 1s, 2p, and 3d orbitals of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so we remember that one that an s orbital is spherical, right? S for spherical. It doesn't really, the, the letters don't really work for any of the other orbitals, so it's kind of hard to say, oh yeah, this stands for this. But just know that the s orbital is spherical. It's like a circle, okay? And we'll draw it to this, uh, we'll say this relative size here. I like that, okay? Um, so it's going to look something like that, and we'll just call this the 1s. All right. Now, 2p, 2p, that's in a higher energy level, so that means the orbital has to be slightly bigger than than what would be scaled as, a, let's say, if it was there was if there was a possibility of having a 1p, would have this 2p would have to be definitely bigger. So we'll say, here's, um, here's this one. Here's the 2 2p. We'll say 2p. Okay, 2p orbital. Um, they didn't tell us what orientation they wanted on. This is technically the 2p y, right? If we're looking on the x y z axis, so x y z. Okay, this is technically the 2PY. All right, now in the 3D, 3D, 3 is definitely higher in energy, right? So it's got to be a, a slightly bigger orbital, something like that. And remember, these are these look like clovers. Um, actually, let me redraw this here. Um, they they kind of look like clovers, um, just four lobes. And then typically, oops, I want to draw it to scale. Typically, you'll want to you'll want to draw in or. Uh, uh, put two of the lobes out of phase like this, okay? So something to this effect. It doesn't have to be perfect, but as long as they can see that you're understanding how to draw these orbitals, um, that's all that they care about, okay? All right, so what is a node? A node is a region of space, region of space, where there is no, or there's, uh, let's say, zero, zero percent chance of finding an electron. Uh, and we'll say of a particular energy. Uh, particular, whoops, particular energy. Okay. Now, what that means is when you're looking at this, right, when, when, I, when I look at this orbital and I ask, where is the electron in this orbital? And the answer is that the electron is the orbital. It is this orbital. It's creating this space. And the reason is, is because remember in quantum theory, we're, we are treating the electron as a wave, right? It's not a particle. It's not bouncing around in this area per se. It's a wave move, creating this orbital, okay? So it has what we call wave-particle duality, where it, it both works sometimes as a particle and sometimes as a wave. When we're talking about quantum theory like this in, in terms of um, atomic orbitals, we're always talking about the electron in terms of a wave, okay? And if you can notice, there's, there's these points at which there are no lobes, right? There's no point at which the electron touches this region. And this is the node. That's the node. That's where there's zero chance of finding the electron. And this has to do with the concept that if we treat the electron as a wave, remember if, you, if you've ever drawn like a sine wave or a cosine wave, okay, here's a typical wave. Um, this, anyway, this here's, a, here's our positive one and negative one, okay? This region is zero, right? That The, the wave will always, if it's a true wave, it's always going to cross zero at some point, right? And so this right here on a typical, this is a cosine wave, right? On a typical wave like this, this is going to, the, the wave is equal to zero at some point, And that's the same here, okay? So it just so happens that, you know, um, as you increase subshells, you increase the number of nodes. And so notice that here we have not just not just one region here, but two regions here. These, these are what we call planar nodes. There are two different kinds of nodes that we'll talk about. Um, these are planar nodes that cut these orbitals into pieces, okay? And where we won't find the electron at all. So it says, how many total nodes will be given uh, in any uh, orbital? How many or nodes will any given orbital have? And the answer has to do with the principal quantum number. And it's always going to be n minus 1 nodes, okay? N minus 1 nodes. So if you have, let's say um, you're looking at a 4p orbital, First of all, you know that this orbital is going to have three nodes, or this 4s four, uh, four orbital will have three nodes as well. They may be different kinds of nodes, but they'll always be three nodes, okay? Um, and uh, we'll kind of go over examples here in a little bit of what that looks like, but total nodes will always be equal to n minus 1, okay? So if I have a, a 72f orbital, that means I have 71 nodes, okay? 71 nodes. That's just, it's just general concept of, of how many nodes we have. Okay. So what, let us see, what is the difference between a planar and a radial node? Okay. So what I've shown you, what I showed you up here, these are planar nodes. These cut right through the actual orbitals themselves. Okay. And they're on a plane. It, it, it's hard to draw these in 3d, but this is actually, think of it like a, a big balloon that has a, a bulge here, a bulge here, a bulge here, and a bulge here. And we kind of put like rubber bands around it in these sections and we call these planar nodes. 
Okay, now um, a radial node would be like, let's say I'm, I'm drawing a 2s orbital. Okay, here's, I'm going to draw a 2s orbital. What I'd have to draw is first draw the 1s orbital, and then I could draw the second one, right? This, this now would be the 2s. And then the space in between them, the space in between them is the radial node. It separates nodes on, based on their principal quantum number, okay? So um, really, um, you, you, what you may hear is that radial nodes are spherical, radial nodes... Uh, are spherical and planar nodes. Um, planar nodes just cut. Planar nodes, uh, planar nodes cut through the nucleus. Okay, through the nucleus. In other words, these nodes, where these nodes are, is usually where the nucleus is. Okay, but these radial nodes will just separate nodes uh, or separate orbitals that are of the same type of subshell but that are in different energy levels. So this is separating the 1s, for example, from the 2s, okay? So how, many, how, how can you tell how many planar and radial nodes an orbital will have? Well, all you have to do is find out um, L, okay? L tells you number of planar nodes, right? So if you, look, if you look up here, right, this is a p orbital, okay, a p orbital. When p, what's the L value for p? L is equal to 1, right? for a p orbital. What that means is it has one planar node. And that's that's where we get this value. That's why we know that there's only one planar node. And that's how we get this shape here is because L is equal to one. And a d orbital, right? If you remember d, L is equal to two. And does that make sense? Because we, we, we see these two planar nodes. So the angular momentum quantum number L will tell you how many planar nodes you have. And then based on n minus one, that will tell you how many radial nodes you have left. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have a four d orbital. And they're asking you how many are planar and how many are radial. Well, you know that a d, if a d orbital will have two, right? Two planar nodes, two planar. Uh, I'll, I'll just put two. I will say planar, okay? But you know that because n is equal to four, that there are three total nodes, three total nodes. So if two of them, if two of them are planar, then there must be one radial, okay? So radial is easiest to find out after you've already incorporated the number of planar nodes. Okay, so when they give you, so just look at the principal quantum number, take n minus one, figure out what L is, and then just take the difference to get the radi number of radial nodes. Okay, all right, for 5e, e says for the n equals six shell, how many total nodes will each orbital have? How many nodes are radial and how many are planar? Okay, so what we'll have to do is look at each one individually. So we know that for every subshell, for every orbital, they're all going to have all orbitals in n equals six, we'll have five nodes, right? Five nodes, that's n minus one, okay, five nodes. So let's look at L is equal to zero. How many planar nodes is that? We'll say planar, um, let's, let's make this a little nicer over here. We'll say planar, radial, okay? We're gonna, and we're gonna determine um, which ones, um, or how many of each, each subshell is gonna have. So. Um, first, let's go with L is equal to zero. L is, L is equal to zero. Okay, that's zero planar. And if there are five nodes, then that means there are five radial. Okay, L is equal to one. That means there's one planar and four radial. L is equal to two. That's two, ra two planar and three radial. And you see the pattern here? Not too bad, right? Um, if you just take the difference, you always know there's going to be five nodes. And then L is going to tell you which... Um, how many of each you're going to have, so, or at least how many planar nodes you should have, so it's at 5 and 0, okay? So that's how many each orbital will have, and an orbital in the L equals 0, and L is equal to 0 subshell, or the S subshell will have 0 planar and 5 radial. L is equal to 1, or P or subshell will have 1 planar and 4 radial, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's how we look at nodes, and that's kind of how we're working with orbitals right now, um, and I hope that was helpful. We'll see you in part 2.